Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Chloe. Um, I'm from Nottingham Trent University and I've very recently finished my PhD. So today I'm going to give a brief summary of some of the findings um, which explored how um, people perceive the success of, um, in the intervention of carnival coexistence. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so as I'm sure we're all aware, there have been many techniques have been designed to increase coexistence between humans and large carnivores. Um, so, for example, here we've got livestock guardian dogs, fortified corrals, electric fences, herders, combination of methods. Um, so, for example, a herder and an electric fence, and there are all sorts of other methods. So, the majority of the evaluations um, typically focus on sort of quantitative measurements of before and after, usually focusing on um, farmer recall. But we know that perceptions of carnivores are not shaped by livestock loss alone, and people's attitudes and their perceptions influence whether they accept or reject, use these mitigation strategies independently of scientific evidence. So we really need to try and understand how the end users, so in this case the farmers, how do they perceive success? What are the factors that contribute to success in their opinions? So my study took place in the very north of the Limpopo province, South Africa. The area is predominantly rural. It's made up of crop, um, game and livestock farms. And it's a typical example of the dualistic economy that occurs in South Africa. So you get these large commercial farms alongside much smaller subsistence farming communities. And the farmers involved in my study would typically be classed as commercial farmers. Um, most were of African descent. Um, and the area is situated in the wider Vembi, Bida, Vembi Biosphere Reserve. So it's not protected, um, but there are pockets of protected land and it's home to a large range of carnivores. So leopard, jackal, caracal, brown hyena, spotted hyena and dispersing cheetah and wild dog. So farmers uh, face um, a lot of a livestock depredation and they use a variety of methods to protect their livestock. So I used uh, mainly interviews and I used an approach called grounded theory, um, which I'm happy to speak about later, but I'm not going to go into much detail here. Um, but it basically it's in-depth interviews and it tries to really give the participants voice and look at what is shaping their perceptions. So I asked participants, you know, what, how was success measured? How do you measure success? And perhaps not surprisingly, most of my participants used measures of livestock loss. And this was measured in a variety of different ways. So we did have the typical before and after the implementation of interventions, reduced numbers of injury or loss. And then we also had sort of change in potential for loss. So perhaps before they were seeing tracks around their farm or where the livestock was, and since they've put up a new corral or a fence, they don't see these tracks anymore. And some, for some people, success was very much about separating livestock and carnivores into different areas of the farm. So they put up large game fences and electric fences and try to separate wildlife and livestock into different areas of the farm. So whilst these may look fairly similar, they were shaped by many different factors. And I'm just going to touch on three of these today. So I think trust is a very important one. Um, and I've got a little quote here from one of, a couple of my participants. Um, so they need to trust that the method they're going to use is actually going to work. So in this example, the farmer had heard about livestock guardian dogs, heard that they work, but when they got one themselves, they found that their dog just laid around and didn't work, so they gave it back. So we've got to have trust in the methods that they're going to work. And also, perhaps as a conservationist, we've got to have trust that the farmers are going to use the method and they're going to do what they agree to do. So for example, in many of the livestock guardian dog programs, when the farmer is given a dog, they sign an agreement that they're going to cease all lethal control. So we've got to con trust that the farmer is going to do that. And then we had acceptance. So again, there were two strands to acceptance. So we've got to accept that perhaps it's not possible to stop all losses. And even with the use of these interventions, there are going to be some losses. And I think it's summed up nicely by one of the participants here who says, I live in the bushveld, it's part of nature. So it's understanding where this level of acceptable loss is and knowing people's threshold for acceptable loss. And we've also got to accept that these methods aren't going to use for everyone. 
Um, so they might be successful for most people, but there are always going to be some exceptions to this. So I think a nice example, um, I had a protected area manager who had problems with neighbouring farmers where the farmers were saying, oh, your leopards are coming off your reserve and they're eating my livestock. So in this example, the um, reserve manager helped place a livestock guardian dog on this farm, but there were some issues with training the dog and using the dog properly <laughs> so it didn't work and the dog had to um, move farm. So I think we've got to accept that, yes, these methods might be successful, but they're not going to work for everyone. And then farmer networks. So I found the farmers in my study really trusted and used information from other farmers far more than they would from any kind of conservationist. So if farmers had said, oh, this method is successful, I've got a guard dog and it's really working, I've got a new electric fence, you should get one, the other farmers would um, you know, believe that and think, okay, great, I'm going to get one too now. But also, it was important to acknowledge that these farmer networks can also work the other way. So one bad experience um, within a community, so someone getting a guard dog and it not working, uh, they spread this to the other farmers saying, no, don't bother to get the dog, it's not worth it. Uh, my one didn't work, it sat and lazed in the sun. <coughs> it's going to prevent the uptake of these interventions in that community. So where that happens, I think it's important to be aware of it and know that, okay, perhaps then we need to work and... How can we then communicate that, okay, it didn't work in this instance, but look, there are other examples of it working well. So with all these different perceptions, different factors contributing to success, how, how can I look at how similar these were, what were the patterns, and where did people disagree and agree? So I then conducted a Q method study. So a little bit about Q method, it's a means of sort of characterizing human subjectivities, and has recently been used to understand subjectivities relevant to conservation <coughs> policies. So in Q method, participants are handed statements, usually on cards, and they sort these um, onto a grid from most degree to least degree. And then you can look, um, you can correlate all the Q sorts from different <laughs> participants and look at areas of consensus and um, disagreement. So I had 36 statements, which all came from the, my interviews. So I um, included statements about how people measured success and the factors that contributed to this. And I made sure to include the majority views, but also the extreme views. And then I had 14 participants, so a very small scale study, but QSort usually uses these very small sample sizes. And I had farmers, conservation practitioners and protected area managers do the sorts. Um, and then I conducted factor analysis. So interestingly, I had two distinct <laughs> factors emerge from the study. Um, Long-term collaboration, and interestingly, this was taken by six conservationists and one farmers, and then factor two, which was all farmers. So I think this tells us that perhaps, you know, underlying, we might have some, some of the same opinions, but actually we're still trying to evaluate these measures and perceive success in slightly different ways. So my factor one, they favoured long-term measurements with a collaboration between farmers and conservationists. And ideally, if they could, they would have done um, sort of standardised testing where they test different methods against a control and look at which was most successful. Um, which obviously we know is not always practical in a field situation, but perhaps from background training and scientific method and practice, that would be um, a sort of go-to as to how we would approach field experiments. And then in contrast, the farmers favoured um, sort of economic considerations. So what methods are affordable? If I've got money, it's going to be far easier to achieve success and protect my livestock. And perhaps this stems a bit from the nature of my participants being these large commercial farmers. Some of them had huge farms and vast amounts of money. So they were, in most cases, investing in these methods themselves. So they wanted to know that what they were buying was going to be worthwhile. And they also thought that long-term measures were most important. And interestingly, they felt that farmers and conservationists determined success in different ways. So perhaps underlying that human-human um, -human conflict that often um, is in these scenarios. So the great thing about Q-Method is we can identify these areas of consensus. 
And I think areas of consensus are really important when we're engaging with stakeholders. Um, we can use these areas to start a dialogue to say, OK, we're from different backgrounds, different perspectives, but look, we've got these shared ideas, shared perspectives. We may differ on this, so how can we come to a compromise and work together? So I think the key recommendations from my study um, in terms of evaluating um, mitigation success is you need to agree beforehand how you're going to do it and what you're going to do. And you've got to involve the stakeholders, in this case, the farmers in this. So really you need tr clear transparency of the setup, maintenance and long-term costs. And I think I've heard particularly over the last few days a bit about the cost benefit analysis. And I think this data exists. We know often the cost of these mitigation methods, but perhaps what's missing is the dissemination of this information to the farmers themselves, particularly in this case where the farmers are buying the strategies themselves. They want to know this information. So how do we communicate what we have perhaps published in scientific papers to the farmers themselves? And prior to implementation, I think really important to discuss how you're going to measure success. Is it livestock loss and in what, case, in what type of livestock loss? Is it less injury, less death, percentage of young raised from birth? And also establish with the farmer what is an acceptable level of loss. Um, each farmer in my study had a very different circumstance. Some had large farms, some were a bit smaller, some had very large herds of livestock. Um, some were much smaller, some were completely reliant on their livestock, whereas others, actually, livestock was just something they did on the side, which is going to influence how much loss um, they're able to cope with. So I think, really, the take-home message is um, that, yeah, we need to establish how we're going to monitor and evaluate these methods from before we implement them, and we need to understand what the farmers perceive, because ultimately, if they're not um, using these methods or they don't perceive them to be successful, perhaps it's not going to change their behaviour towards carnivores. And yeah, thank you. Thanks for your support. Right, uh, we have time for one, two questions maximum. Hi, Chloe. Nice to meet you eventually. Ian Truby from Fawn and Flora International. We collaborate with one of your other students oh, yeah. looking at the impact of livestock guarding dogs on biodiversity in the Romanian Carpathians. And you had one quote about the dogs not being effective, and a lot of the work we do comes down to individual behaviours of dogs and how effective they are and appropriate training. Did you find any evidence of historical use of livestock guarding dogs or in terms of conflict mitigations from perhaps some of the more traditional local farming communities that have been there in the region and how they related to dogs as a companion and a, an animal with, with use. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, some of the farmers had, um, were involved in the livestock guarding dog programs, but some just used their own dogs. You know, you'd see these small yeppy jackals as their guard dogs. Um, so I think traditionally they'd use just any dog that they <coughs> had previously. And again, yeah, some with success and some without. But yeah, I didn't, um, unfortunately I didn't get to include some of the smaller, more subsistence communities in my study and I think they would have had a different experience maybe.